What's up, guys, and happy Monday. I'm your host, Amala Epinobi, and today it's just me on the show. It's just you, girl. We're going to be hanging out, going through all the different news that's been bubbling up over the weekend, and we're going to talk it through. And today, we're going to be focusing on a couple of mic drop moments that I've come across on the internet, one featuring Ann Coulter on Bill Maher, going back and forth about why we're not necessarily getting photos or identification of suspects when it comes to some of the recent shootings that have happened in the U.S. of of a delving into that where she sort of delivers a speechless <laughs> a comment that just leaves them silenced for a moment. They don't know exactly how to deal with what she said. So we'll reference that in a, a broader conversation about why there's a certain narrative the media likes to spin. Plus, Joy Reid thinks that she quite literally built this country. We're going to circle back on our Ebony Alert story that we've covered on this show previously. Plus, black professor at Harvard, Roland Fry is circulating on the internet and you know I love the sound of that you guys know I love Roland Fryer talking about his findings when it came to investigating police shootings all that and more on today's show let's start off with Ann Coulter uh, going head-to-head -head with Bill Maher and Van Jones and the topic of recent shootings in the United States comes up specifically what happened at the Kansas City Chiefs parade subsequent to them winning the Super Bowl they held this whole parade as you all know know a shooting occurred at this parade. I believe 22 people ended up being injured, many of them children. And in the wake of that shooting, we weren't getting a lot of information from the media as to who the suspects were, who the perpetrators were. Now, Ann Coulter gives in her idea as to why this is happening. Let's watch that moment. I mean, we don't know who did this shooting, by the way, the, the, the Super Bowl shooting. We have we, some idea. What? If it were a white man shooting We'd know. Well, we don't know. But they, I mean, they That's how we know it's not a white man, I can tell you that much. Do you think they were, they were repressing that reporting? They wouldn't tell us about the um, transgender woman that shot up the Christian school for what, like a year? Um, oh, San Bernardino out here. Remember the crazy terrorist Muslims? I, that's when I first noticed, hmm, they're not telling us who it is. I, it's not a white male. 
The longer they go without telling you, it's not a white male. Okay, Wait. well, we don't, we, for this one, for right now, as of Friday night, February 16th, we, know. we, don't, we don't officially know. Okay, you know, you have special powers. Um, but, I mean, we don't. Okay, so you've seen the clip there. It's interesting that I feel like I see clips like this on Bill Maher, you know, often. I can reference older ones that we've discussed on this show before. There is a pretty famous clip now of Dennis Prager having gone on Bill Maher, I believe in 2019, where he's expressing to Bill in the panel, you know, the left believes that men can menstruate, right? This is a real deal uh, claim that is being made. And right now, you are maybe not seeing it as much as you are going to, but that is what they're saying. That is the claim they're making. And Bill Maher claims that he's heard no such thing. The other panelists start making fun of Dennis, saying, you know, they thought that he was up to date on everything and they've never heard of such a thing from the left. Now check in, now five years later, I'm pretty sure we got a story yesterday about how trans woman's breast milk is the same as a biological woman's breast milk, and it's just as good for a baby as food. And we've heard many a time that men can menstruate, but at the time, Bill Maher and his panelists were not ready to hear that. I am getting a very similar sentiment from what Ann Coulter has said in this video of, you know what, if we're not hearing about the suspects, the perpetrators outright, it's probably because they're not white men. And we have several instances to back this up. She talks about the Kansas City Chiefs parade, which clearly does not seem to be a white male perpetrator, yet you don't see it all over the media plastered everywhere that this is who's responsible for that shooting. And Coulter mentions the trans man, I believe, that was responsible for the shooting at uh, Joel Olstein's church. And we have photos here of that individual. So this was somebody born, a woman, Janess Moreno, who goes by Jeffrey and was responsible for the shooting that happened at Joel Olstein's church. Yet you did not see that plastered all over the media. It wasn't making headlines. It wasn't front page news. Why is that? Can anybody let me know why they would not put a trans shooter on the front page? Is it maybe because it doesn't fit a particular narrative that we've all seemingly subscribed ourselves to, that this is a protected, marginalized class who is not capable of inflicting harm on other people? And to have somebody who is a shooter from that marginalized, protected class really flies in the face of the oppression narrative that we're trying to sell each other and keep pushing in this modern day and age. Now, not only that as an example, there was horrific news out of Minneapolis, and uh, here is some of it, that there were three officers shot, two of whom were killed, and subsequently a firefighter slash paramedic who was also shot and killed. And here they are, um, Paul Elmstrand, Matthew Rouge, I hope I'm saying his last name correctly, and Adam Finseth. Now, these three men lost their lives, and they lost their lives in responding to a domestic violence call where they were told, you know, there's a father in this house with his family. He has firearms. He's acting violently. We need somebody to come and take care of the situation. They show up, and what becomes an hours-long back-and-forth uh, meeting with the police and this man ends in three deaths, two officers, one firefighter slash paramedic, and the man who was responsible for all of this turmoil ended up taking his own life. Now, we've there's been crickets, crickets essentially, in the media as to who this man is, although we know the identities of both police officers, the third one that was shot, and the firefighter slash paramedic who had his life taken. Why is it that they can so quickly get out this information, but have yet to let us know who the suspect is? And right before we went live uh, today, and I came to speak to you guys, we got this photo of uh, the supposed suspect in this shooting, and this is from uh, Breaking 911, Shannon Gooden is the gunman who murdered the two cops and paramedic in Minnesota. Yet if you go and look into the uh, New York Post, Washington Post, all these different publications, crickets, 
You're not hearing at all about who the person responsible for this is. So it's interesting to me that Ann Coulter is going on Bill Maher and saying, I have a theory as to why we're maybe not getting these names fast enough. And the theory is because they are not white men. And she gets laughed at and told that, you know, she must be able to see the future or have some sort of crystal ball or special powers because she senses this to be true. I think she has something called pattern recognition. <laughs> and her pattern recognition is working in seeing that the media constantly pushes down stories like this that don't fit their narrative. And the narrative is, if you are a member of a marginalized class, we don't want it getting out that you have done something bad because it doesn't fit our narrative. And this has started a very, very long time ago with all the different racial divide in this country, with segregating people into different classes based on these superficial identities. But it really came to a head or at least had a had a catalyst uh, moment in 2020 with George Floyd. We all watched what happened there. We all had mixed opinions and feelings about the altercation between Derek Chauvin, the police officer, and George Floyd. But that further cemented this idea that if there is a black person involved in any storyline, it is always in victimhood and never as a perpetrator, never as a criminal, never as a thug. In fact, thug is a racist dog whistle. We're, we're supposedly not even supposed to use that word anymore to refer to people because it has apparently become a racialized term. And we'll get to a video where a man says exactly that. So what happened with George Floyd led to this narrative being perpetrated even further. And now we get stories like this where, you know, there's been a shooting. You know who's died. You know who the victims are. You know who's been injured. But God forbid we let you know who the suspect is because we don't want you to think that black people or trans people or Hispanic people or illegal immigrants are capable of committing crimes and harming others. Now, I'm going to show you this clip of the Kansas City Mayor Quinton Lucas, who is condemning Missouri Governor Mike Parson for referring to the Kansas City parade shooters as thugs. Apparently, if you go into a crowd of people and you end up indiscriminately shooting a ton of them, injuring over 20 people, many of whom are kids, we are not supposed to refer to you as thugs because that is a racist dog whistle. Let's hear it. He's going to join us later on in this program. After the shooting, he said, we can't let some thugs and criminals just take over and ruin what happened. I gather that's not quite your assessment of what happened that day. I have respect for the governor. Uh, we get along well. I, I disagree strongly with uh, how he would describe that situation. I, I certainly do think this was criminal activity. It was lawlessness. And I think that uh, that's troubling. But thugs is a dog whistle in the most classic sense. And I have seen this dog whistle time and again. There's this kind of giant conservative theory on social media now that the reason that monk shots haven't been shown is because the purported defendants are black. And if it were a white defendant, we would have just shown them. That is absolutely preposterous. There are protections to juveniles. Our city has a gun violence problem. Okay, so his excuse for uh, these mugshots not being shown or people not talking about the suspects, people not even identifying the race of the suspects, is that these individuals are minors and we are unable to share the information of minors. Okay, let's hear that out. I'll, I'll listen to that. I can understand there's protection set in place for minors and, and maybe we wouldn't just go throwing around their photos and talking about their identities, names, age, all that different stuff. That wasn't exactly what we did with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse when he got in trouble for committing an act of self-defense. His face was plastered all over. Everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew his age. Everybody knew his race. How exactly are we squaring that with what's happening today? Now, mix that with these other stories that we have of the trans shooter at the Joel Olstein church who was a grown woman. Her face wasn't plastered everywhere. We weren't told uh, what her race was. In fact, her race was wrongly uh, put into whatever system they use to book suspects. How do we square that? <laughs> How do we square what's just happened in Minneapolis with these two police officers and the firefighter with that grown man not having his identity and his face plastered everywhere, even though he's not a minor? These arguments are 
quite frankly, not adding up for me anymore. The math is not mathing. It's so very clear that what Ann Coulter said is very much true. I might not agree with Ann Coulter on everything, as you probably shouldn't agree with anybody on everything. That would be typical to, I think, being a human being. But with what she said there and her pattern recognition on the fact that if you are a white man, guaranteed, everybody's gonna know your name and identity. And if you're anything else, you probably have a little bit of time before that comes out. She is right on the mark, and it is all based on the underlying narrative that we've decided is somehow true of victim and victor, oppressor and oppressed. Now, if there's somebody who's going to consistently reinforce that narrative, it is Joy Reid. Here's a new clip of her that's gone viral. It's got 3.5 million views of her saying that she literally, physically built this country. And to find out that literally Barack Obama's two terms in pre as president are your reparations, and Juneteenth, which you already celebrated anyway, is your reparations, and yet you built this country. You literally physically built this country, and yet the attitude toward you from a lot of your peers and your fellow citizens is just shut up and be grateful. And it's, it's, it's infuriating. Okay. <laughs> joy, joy, joy. Joy Reid, mind you, guys, is, is pretty silver spoon fed. And I know she doesn't want to hear that she should shut up and be grateful. And I'm not going to say exactly those words. I'm just going to say maybe an exercise in, in gratitude would be something that is beneficial to her. This woman is a Harvard graduate, hosts her own show on TV nearly every night, hairstylist, makeup done, making plenty of money, and still feels as though she and others deserve reparations. And I'll correct her in saying that, you know, Barack Obama being president was not your reparations. Juneteenth was not your reparations. Black people, in fact, did not receive reparations in, in large part. And maybe that's something that should have been taken care of as soon as slaves were emancipated. In fact, not even maybe, it should have been taken care of. There should have been reparations given to those who were emancipated from their slavery to help with that transition and to try to make good on something that it is nearly impossible to make good on, and that is being enslaved. But to sit here in Joy Reid's position, a Harvard-educated, Harvard silver spoon-fed woman who's making plenty of money and is on the TV every single night and say that she somehow deserves more and that to ask her for a practice of gratitude is too much of an ask is simply ridiculous. But all these stories loop together and feed into one another because it doesn't matter how little you've done as a black person or even how much harm you've done as a black person in your community. You can kill people, shoot up parades, kill police officers and firefighters and paramedics. You will still be viewed as a victim and when referred to as a thug, we will call that a racist dog whistle. Then if you move up in status and have the life of, say, a Joy Reid, where you are Harvard educated, you're on TV, people look to you for your opinion and for hopefully a wisdom, although it seems to be lacking in this instance, you are still a victim and more is owed to you. It doesn't matter where you are at on the spectrum of being a human being, the goodness that you give to the world, how many crimes you commit, how much money you've made, your blackness is what is the ultimate defining characteristic in your life. And if that does not strike you as wrong, please let me know in the comments down below how that it all makes sense, how it squares up for you, because I can guarantee you that Joy Reid played little to no part in building this country, especially not physically. So I'm not sure what this deep attachment she has to this idea is. I know we're all told that we're meant to be so deeply connected to our ancestors, both the good and bad, and we use that selectively in whatever way it makes sense for us, but we should challenge that. I am not the good that my ancestors did in the past. I am not the bad that my ancestors did in the past. I am me. I am who I am in this moment. I am giving what I'm giving to the world in this moment. And I don't deserve praise or payment or reparations for something that somebody who was not me <laughs> experienced and went through. And we are really trading what are real moments in our lives to grow as people and build our characters 
to attach ourselves to a life that we never even lived. And you'll see there's such emotion in Joy Reid's face. She's so deeply attached to something that she has never experienced. And how we got here, I know a little uh, through education. I'm sure Harvard played a role in teaching her exactly that when they could have been reinforcing her accomplishment of having gotten into that university. But we need to rewind a little bit because we are not our ancestors. And that deep attachment that we have to that is actually feeding into this current narrative that we are perpetual victims, that we cannot be looked at as thugs, nor can we be looked at as champions because we're, we're somehow owed something. And when you look into some of the things we're, we're doing today that are supposedly supposed to be helping black people, I cannot find the through line. We spoke on this channel before about Ebony Alerts. And for those of you who don't know what that is, let me fill you in. <laughs> Y'all know those Amber Alerts that you get on your phone. It's the loud alarm. They tell you, you know, a kid has been kidnapped near you. They're in a gray sedan. Here's the license plate. And hopefully you'll be able to spot this car, alert law enforcement, and be able to send them to the position of this child so that child can be saved. They've decided, in California at least, to segregate Amber Alerts, and now we have something known as the Ebony Alert. I cannot make this up. They wanted to create an, an alert for black kids in particular, in black minors, and they decided to name it the Ebony Alert. Now, finally, an Ebony Alert has uh, gone out, and this was one of the first uh, for a 14-year-old a here. I must ask, how is this helping. How is this doing anything for black people? You're getting the same exact alert on your phone, yet we've just decided that because somebody is black, we're going to name it Ebony instead of Amber. Does that at all do anything to help black lives, to, to even save the lives of these children? I don't think so. If anything, I think it's fueling racial divide even further to where if you're going to give what seemingly comes off as special treatment to a certain group of people or a certain race, people may even start to ignore those alerts at, at a rate at which we have not seen before. A lot of this divide that we are fueling in the name of helping black people is actually furthering the divide between the races in this country and our different communities and making it harder to help black people and African Americans. And when you dive deeply into some of the facts, which I'll put in air quotes, that we're using to reinforce these ideas and to say these things are necessary, we're finding they're not true. Now, I'm going to show you guys a video of Roland Fryer, who is a black Harvard professor. He's tenured at Harvard, and he is really uh, got his claim to fame in identifying blackness, uh, police brutality, all of these different angles that are given to us as black people for what we should believe, how the world is built for us, how the United States is against us, how police hate us. And he took it upon himself as an economist to look into some of the claims being made. Now, what he found shocked him and shocked the world. And instead of people wanting to see the research and the evidence that he has put together, they told him to stay silent. And why? Because it didn't fit the narrative. And I'm going to let him tell you himself. Let's watch. I collected a lot of data. We collected millions of observations on uh, everyday use of force that wasn't lethal. We collected thousands of observations on lethal force. And, and it was in this moment, 2016, that I realized people lose their minds when they don't like the result. So what my paper showed, you'll see tomorrow, uh, like some of you, uh, was that, yes, we saw some bias in the low-level uses of force, every day pushing up against cars and things like that. People tend to like that result. But we didn't find any um, uh, racial bias in police shootings. Now. That was really surprising to me because I expected to see it. The little known fact is I had eight full-time RAs that it took to do this over nearly a year. When I found this surprising result, I hired eight fresh ones and redid it. Now let's unpack that before we go any further into this video. There's so much to be said about what he's just divulged. One, 
that there can be certain amounts of research or evidence that people like and enjoy and want to see, and then there is other research and evidence that people dislike and don't want to see. And as much as we know that's true, it's kind of astounding to hear it said out loud that you can like a fact or dislike a fact, doesn't matter. It's the facts, right? So if you're finding instances of bias and people are cheering that on, as he said he found in lower levels of bias, like stop and frisks and being pushed against cars, things like that, he was finding that police had maybe a, a racial bias injected in those acts. Why would people be cheering for that? Why would they be happy about that? Why would they like that finding? It's because it reinforces what they already believe, that black people are victims. So if you think about that in the broader sense of academia, that means you have a lot of supposed academics who are simply going out into their fields of research looking for things that already support what they believe. They're looking for research that they like rather than research and findings that are true. And to dislike somebody finding out that there in fact is evidence that police do not have bias when it comes to shooting people based on race, mind blowing. You should be elated to hear that there is evidence to suggest that, especially since police brutality is a keystone in many of the racial arguments that we're having today. It's leading to protests and riots, people fighting each other in the streets, people killing police officers. You should be over the moon to hear that there is research that dispels that myth and says, you know what, maybe it's not true. Yet he was told that they should not publish this research and that they should not let it out to the public. And he took it upon himself, mind you, as a good academic, to say, you know what, I, I came with these foundings and I had eight RAs find this, let's do it again. Let's loop it back over. I'm going to hire eight new people who may or may not have their own biases to do the exact same research again and see if we come to the same conclusion. Now, I'll let him tell you what he found. To make sure. They came up with the same exact answer, and I thought it was robust. And then I went to go give it, and my God, all hell broke loose. It was a 104-page, dense, academic, economics paper with a 150-page appendix, okay? It was posted for four minutes when I got my first email. This is full of shit. Doesn't make any sense. And I wrote back, how'd you read it that fast? That's amazing. You are a genius. And I had colleagues take me into to the side and say, don't publish this. You'll ruin your career. Pause. Now this shows an even broader problem. How is it that in the halls of academia, you have people responding to something of this length, saying it's bullshit before they've even read it? And I've experienced this on a much smaller level than what Roland Fryer went on to experience in his career, having found these uh, findings and, and putting them out to people. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But. I've gone to college campuses to speak to students and do little you know, seminars or a talk here, a speech there. And before I've even arrived on the campus, you have members of faculty and students calling for the entire event to be, to be shut down before they even have any idea about what I'm going to say. And they're publishing things like, she's a transphobe, she's a racist, she's a white supremacist, before even knowing me. And that seems to be the exact same thing that's happened here. They've made up their minds about the conclusion before they've even gone to do the study. And if that does not terrify you when it comes to the halls of higher education, if that does not undercut the value of going into higher education, I don't know what does. The last thing I would want uh, as a student is an educator who's already made up their mind before looking at information. And the fact that he had a colleague email him and say, this is not true, before he's even read what he's found, insane insane and then to go on to tell him that if he publishes it it's going to ruin his career if you publish fact it will ruin your career are we seeing the through line in these stories today because i'm feeling it mm. i said what are you talking about i said what's wrong with it do you believe the first part yes do you believe the second part well it's the issue is they just don't fit together 
we like the first one, but you should publish the, no the second one another time. I said, let me ask this. If the second part about the police shootings, this is a literal conversation. I said to them, if the second part uh, showed bias, do you think I would, should publish it then? And they said, yeah, then it would make sense. And I said, I guarantee you I'll publish it. We'll see what happens. So it was, it was you know, I, I lived under, under um, police protection for about 30 or 40 days. I had a seven-day-old daughter at the time. I remember going and shopping for it because, you know, when you have a newborn, you think you have enough diapers. You don't. So I, I was going to the grocery store to get diapers with the armed guard. It was crazy. It was really, truly crazy. Do y'all hear that? All for publishing research, you have to go under police protection. So funnily enough, because a black man did a study and found not even did a study, he just looked into the numbers, okay? Because a black man looks into the numbers on police brutality and finds out that, you know what, maybe there is no racial bias in police brutality when it comes to you know lethal use of force or more extreme measures. Because he found that out and published it, he's now forced to be under the protection of police officers. <laughs> so these leftists who believe, oh, police are out to kill black men, that's what they're there for, and you found something that dispels that claim, I'm gonna put you under police protection as a black man. And that is, you know, part of what Roland Fryer went through as an educator. You've heard me talk about him many times on this show, but because of the research that he did that ended up dispelling a lot of the stuff that we, we currently think. He found out about police brutality. He, hit, he did a whole uh, paper on acting white and found out that as black kids were more successful in school and getting better grades, they lost friends among the black community and were viewed as acting white and were no longer popular amongst the black community. So because he published findings like this, he had a target on his back. Uh, almost the entirety of his time at Harvard. And one of the people responsible for really driving the knife into Roland Fryer in his time at Harvard was none other than Claudine Gay, who we all know now as the former president of Harvard who, has, who had to resign due to plagiarism. Claudine Gay did not like Roland Fryer whatsoever. And that's because she was the queen of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And he was the one who was challenging DEI every time he got the opportunity to through nothing more than facts, not even from his own opinion or his strong convictions on the matter through facts that he was finding. And because she didn't really like what he had to say, she wanted to revoke his tenure, which didn't end up happening, luckily, as he is still a very powerful force in academia at this moment, but all because he decided to challenge a narrative. He also went through a slew of, of sexual assault allegations from a, a colleague, and Harvard ended up investigating that and throwing tens of those allegations out on him. So the man has had a target on his back ever since he started finding things like this, and all because we've decided what it means to be black in America. We've decided what that experience is. And it doesn't matter if the facts reinforce it or not. It matters that we've just decided that that's the fact. There are so many people that if you go out on the street and ask them, you know, how many black people do you think are killed by a police officer on an annual basis? How many unarmed black people do you think are killed by police officers on an annual basis? They'll say hundreds, if not thousands. The, the real answer is like a handful, 12, 19, well, one year, I believe. So we have a very distorted view of what reality is. And if you take the time to challenge that reality, you will be chastised, you will be attacked, you will become the next Roland Fryer. And luckily, he's, you know, popping back up. People are constantly finding his work. They're constantly able to talk about it. And he's consistently challenging DEI because what he cares about is actual outcomes. That's what he's concerned with. I'm gonna show you this other video of him discussing DEI at this very same event and being asked about it. And his answer, straightforward, profound, concise. I also don't tolerate foolishness at all, okay? And so you can't put me on a task force where we're gonna spend the semester talking about the new name for black people. I don't wanna do it. Right? You go to my neighborhood and call someone BIPOC, they'll punch you in the face. <laughs> no one care. I care about the real issues. 
right? You know what's offensive? Being unemployed. And so I have had that attitude throughout my career. I don't plan on getting rid of it because I want to make sure we focus on the real issues. And I believe sometimes in universities, we, folk, we start to focus internally on the things that will, but it's not helping the people that we said we came there to help. I also don't talk. That's it. I think that is really what we constantly need to be focusing on because there's a, a million things in this world that are going to make you feel a certain way or that might strike you as racist or bias or this and that and there's a million different stories that we can tell ourselves about how we help uh, black people or the marginalized or the underprivileged but really what it is is about outcomes and they're going to fluff you and, you know, make you feel good about all these different changes that they're making, which we've talked about on this show. Joe Biden recently went and sat with two black kids and their father and ate fried chicken and talked about how they're doing in school. And that's meant to be something done for black America. The uh, a group of, of Democrats put together a hip hop hip hop task force hip hop task force. And the purpose of this hip hop tax task force is to bring about equity through hip hop music. How exactly that's done? I don't know. We've changed the word for black people to BIPOC, to be inclusive and to make people feel better. And apparently that's helping underprivileged communities. And you'll notice that while these things might make you feel good and make you feel like you're an ally and you're doing something great, the outcomes are not translating. The black community is not doing any better. It's not looking any better. It's not feeling any better. But all the allies who are saying BIPOC and eating fried chicken and, you know, paying their tax dollars to the hip hop task force certainly feel better, I guess, about what they're doing. <laughs> Guys, uh, I can't make this stuff up. I wish I wish I could make this stuff up. There's a ton of people out there making stuff up, just like the police brutality numbers and the Joy Reid built this country and all this stuff. But I cannot make this stuff up and we're sitting here wondering why why is why aren't things looking any better <laughs> and it's because i'm pretty sure hip hop task force you know that that doesn't doesn't fix bullet holes last time i checked now we're going to move on to a little bit of uh, other news here and we're going to hop off the the race train i wasn't expecting to stay on it for so long i just uh, had to for these moments i had to go on my little my little tangents there has been Yet another instance of biological men playing against women in sports. And now we have an actual video of uh, how this pans out. This happened at a uh, KIPP Academy basketball game. Now, they were playing against another team. This is the Lowell Collegiate Charter School. Now, the Lowell Collegiate Charter School, which is a basketball team of women, decided to forfeit this game. Now, we'll take a look at the replay here. You guys let me know what you think. Look at this individual here. Yep. So for those of you who aren't seeing right now, there's a, a young guy on that uh, basketball court who is well over six feet, it seems, and a young girl has been thrown to the ground. Does she get up from the ground after that play? No, she stays on the ground uh, clutching her, her lower back after she's been thrown there. It does look like the guy does attempt to maybe give her a hand or help her up, but she's not getting off the ground. Uh, she seem, seemingly is injured. And I imagine she's injured because a six foot something man uh, just threw her to the ground or a six foot something kid. These, these people are in, in the school. We can say that much. Now, why do you think a, a six foot something guy is playing against girls in basketball. It's because he does not identify as a guy or a boy. He apparently identifies as a girl and thus has been able to compete uh, against this school in basketball. Now, the school decided, hey, there's uh, too much going on here. We have too much going on with our female players. This girl's just fallen to the ground uh, and did not get up for, for quite some time. We're just going to forfeit the game. We're going to call the game. We're done playing. And uh, that was the end of it for the, the game that night. 
does this at all make sense to you that we're allowing this to happen? I am well aware of the strength of a man. I know we do kind of give ourselves this narrative of like, we women strong and we're just as strong as men and we're just as capable as men. Y'all, I couldn't fight off a 13 year old boy if he tried me, probably. I I don't think I'm strong enough to take care of that. I'm well aware of my strength. I think I'm somewhat aware of what the general female strength is. And I would not want to play some six foot something guy in basketball, especially if he has the capability of throwing me onto the ground because I too would be fearing that I wouldn't get up. But these girls are being placed in the position of having to kind of quietly go about their business and uh, play these games and do these things because I'm sure as a young girl in high school or you know whatever age these girls are, if you care about your sport, the camaraderie, your friendship, you've been playing basketball for quite some time, that might even be your ticket to, to college or a better school or a better education, I'm going to stick with the basketball and have to deal with what I have to deal with in order to get through it because it's something that I care about. It's something that's going to uh, hopefully build a better future for me. It's an extracurricular. It looks good on college applications. So they're being subjected to male players who are, you know, probably multiple times their their strength and, and capability when compared to one another and having to deal with the injuries that follow. Now, luckily, this is basketball. And it's not something like wrestling or boxing or MMA, because we've seen things like that before. And we all know how that turns out for the women involved. Now, basketball has some, you know, high contact in the sport, but it could be much worse. And you have to ask yourself, what is the logical conclusion of this? How far exactly are we going to go in watching these things happen, especially when it starts to, you know, involve even younger Women. It's one thing if you're a grown woman being involved in these things. It's another to be, you know, a, a girl who's still in school having to deal with this. How far do these things go before we call it and say this doesn't make sense? I think we have a little bit further to go before we truly draw the line. As I said at the top of the show, uh, tomorrow's video is going to be all about uh, breastfeeding children because apparently uh, the NHS, uh, the National Health Service in England, one of their you know foundation trusts in Sussex has said that trans m- breast milk is the same as a, as, as a woman's breast milk. And that's, that's fine. Let's just go ahead and do that with children. Next thing is going to be, why not just allow men to uh, get pregnant? Let's see if we can start working around the science for for transplants and allow them to have babies. And who cares about the baby, right? If it turns out, it turns out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's sort of a little experiment we're doing, just like we're doing with the breast milk, just like we're doing with uh, these girls in sports. Let's just chuck them in there uh, and see what comes out on the other end. Who cares? who it affects, who cares if they have to continue forfeiting games because these things, uh, they make us feel good, guys. Makes us feel good to say we are inclusive, makes us feel good to say we are diverse, and it makes us feel good to say we are equitable. When in fact, this is just the opposite of true diversity, of true inclusion. If your inclusion is to the exclusion of the people that the sport or the place or the rights or the safe space, whatever you want to call it, was made for, then it's not real inclusion. And on that note, guys, (laughs) I think we're going to get into your super chats for today. I'm going to pull them up. We all know Taylor's not here today, so I'm going to pull up your super chats and see what you had to say on these very interesting topics. Okay, first one is from Steven Sanders. He says, I was in a police station uh, filming my business when a man vandalized my camera and the police shook his hand, told me it was a civil issue. Deliberate indifference. Video is on my channel, 23 seconds. Sorry to hear that, Steven. Yeah, I don't know how that would not be dealt with by police. You would think if you were right there and uh, they vandalized your camera somebody would deal with that from 
just put me in the matrix already. Hey there, Amala. Speaking of the tragedy in Minneapolis, I was just leaving work and the firefighters and cops were on three different bridges in solidarity, flying a big American flag for all to see. That is wonderful. I'm, you know, glad to hear that. It's sad because it's just like with with three lives taken of people who were first responders and servicemen, it's just what can you do at this point? And, you know, one of them unfortunately had his life taken in going in to try and save the others. And uh, clearly that did not work out in all for what? For what? Because the shooters killed himself. Luckily, the entire family, I believe, got out of the house and was safe. But now you have three people dead because some guy decided that's the way his day was going to go. It's extremely unfortunate. And hopefully they get more information out about exactly who was responsible. Another one from Just Put Me in the Matrix already says, Hey, Amla, I sent two videos to your Instagram. One is the Apple Vision Pro with the new... And the newest insane uses for them, the other one is an AI video that looks 100% real. I can't anymore put me in the matrix. Yeah, I've been seeing all this stuff. You guys know how I feel about the Apple Vision Pro. If you don't, I did a whole video on that. You can check it out. But this AI video thing that's going around, which I believe is called Sora, and I think that's attached to OpenAI, although there are many other AI video uh, platforms and operating systems you can use at this moment, it's getting really, really strange. I'm seeing a lot more people sort of pop up and give their theories as to the many things that could happen with AI used for video and purposes like this. You're going to have a lot of revenge porny things and people creating horrible images of probably influencers they follow, celebrities, people who go to school with them, their peers. I think that's going to circulate a lot. I you could even go as far as to say people are going to make AI videos of others committing crimes and have that circulate or it's going to be a whole probably division within law enforcement now to identify what are AI videos and what are real videos. And you guys can use your imaginations to figure out all the different ways it could go wrong. Now, of course, there's. I'm sure great things about it. From an artistic standpoint, you could look at it, you know, as a pro or a con. I'm sure a lot of people's art is going to be ripped off in the wake of video technology like this. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be able to create amazing things. Maybe you can type in the plot for a movie and it's going to make you the movie for you. Or you can use it to, you know, cut different corners at work for things that you do. But I, I just like to look at it from all sides and perspectives. There's many things that could go on here. The Taylor fan club, who is still here, despite Taylor not being here, says, as someone who was level-headed and accused if acting white, my, accused of acting white my whole life, it makes me happy to see other black people waking up to the BS around us and pointing out the real source of our problems. Taylor fan club, I am right there with you. My entire life, I have been accused of acting white or told I speak white or whatever. It's neither here nor there. I don't even know what that means. Uh, I think I speak properly, hopefully. I, I think I use proper English. And if that means acting white, I'd say that's a rather unfortunate insult f for the person who's insulting you. Because to associate proper English with whiteness Seems kind of racist. <laughs> Seems like we should challenge that a little bit. I think we're all capable of using proper English. And I encourage all of you to look into that Roland Fryer uh, journal, I believe, or a paper about acting white and how it affected uh, popularity among uh, the, the black community and black children. You'll find that a lot of the narratives we sell ourselves on race are self-inflicted um, and some people will say, well, black people aren't, aren't invited into the higher all, halls of education, and it's purely an affirmative action issue. But a lot of times, you'll see that when black people do come to be successful, especially in academia, they are no longer popular amongst their peers uh, and don't get to enjoy the same lifestyle that they once had before. Celtic Blath Blacksmith says, I started identifying as an eight-year-old recently. I get weird looks, but I don't care because I've been whooping some serious ass in Little League. <laughs> I don't think those eight-year-olds are getting up. That's true. Uh, I think if Celtic Blacksmith is running into these eight-year-olds out there, they're certainly not getting up and 
definitely uh, not as quick as that. It's the woman in the video. We didn't even see her get up, but the eight-year-old stand no chance if we're going to start identifying by different ages. You know, there really are people who do that. There are people who identify as <sighs> children. Okay, I'm going to just leave that there. We're going to keep reading. This last one is, oh my gosh, I don't know how to say your name. Kiara Bielakova? Let me know if I said that even close to what it correctly is. Hey, Amala. Greetings from the Czech Republic. Currently 11 p.m. in here, and for the first time, I see you live. Thanks for your daily social commentaries, and have a nice day. Kiara, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's uh, amazing to hear from people all over the world. Uh, I've never been to the Czech Republic, but I did tell you guys I am going to go to Hungary in August. So that's going to be such a cool thing to experience. And I'm so excited for that. I've never been to a place like Hungary before. In fact, I haven't been um, really to anywhere all that crazy. I've been to Australia, Paris, London, which are all dope, awesome, amazing, but never anywhere like Hungary. So I'm excited to check that box on the list and maybe one day maybe one day the czech republic i'm gonna refresh here and make sure we didn't miss anybody but i think we got them all guys thank you so much for watching today please if you like this video like subscribe click the notification bell to be notified every single time i post a video for you guys which is every single day as i said tomorrow's video is about trans woman's breast milk versus <laughs> biological woman's breast milk. I am not kidding. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And we'll be back uh, on Wednesday to be live. We are live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. And with that, do get out in the comments if you disagree with something I said, but do so respectfully. I am going to be looking through your comments. And thank you guys so much for the love on the song that I posted on Sunday. So many of you had some amazing comments. I'm going to be reading through more of those tonight and responding to you guys. So thank you so much for watching and, and listening to that. And I'm glad that it resonated with many of you. Maybe we'll do some more music in the future. And on that note... I will leave you guys to have a fantastic rest of your Monday or Tuesday, depending where you are. Bye, guys.